Okay, well, it's great to be here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about, I was lucky enough to bring nine guests to the State of the Union, and each of them symbolizes not only something important and good in New York, but good around the whole country. And so I'm going to name those guests and give you a little inkling about each of them. Kevin Kaslowski from Rochester, New York. I stood with Kevin. He was a veteran of the 82nd Airborne, exposed to burn pits, and he went to the VA, asked for help, got none, and took it up as a crusade along with other Rochester veterans. Is one of the people who expo uh, exposed, probably the bad word, um, who taught me about um, the need for the PACT Act and helped push it through. So he'll be there in the gallery. Savion Pollard is a Syracuse University student. He's a Navy veteran. He is the very first hire of Micron's massive $100 billion megafab in central New York that's being built because of my bill, the Chips and Science Bill. There will be Savion Pollards all over the country, people who are getting jobs, good paying jobs for the first time in industries with a great future like ChipFab, which we're returning from China to here. Zanita Everhart, she's a dear, dear lady. Um, I met her um, right after the shooting in Buffalo. Her son, Zaire, was shot in that Buffalo Top supermarket. Uh, fortunately, he lived. Um, and we've, she came down and testified. I Didn't she come down and testify, I believe? Yes. Uh, here uh, to talk about the need for gun legislation. Obviously, we passed some gun legislation that would have dealt with some of the problems of 18-year-olds automatically getting AR-15s, and that's what happened uh, in Buffalo. And uh, so she will be here. Uh, Taylor Jane Stimler is from New York City. Everhart's from Buffalo, um, as I mentioned, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, Taylor is an NYU student, 25-year-old diabetes advocate. Um, we passed the law ensuring that all seniors, I wrote the law, uh, we introduced it, um, that uh, ensured that all seniors would not pay a penny for more than $35 insulin. And we wanted to get it done for everybody. So I put it in the uh, reconciliation bill. As you know, the reconciliation bill knocked out it for below Medicare. So we're going to fight to get that done uh, this year. And Taylor Jane Stimler represents a younger person who desperately needs uh, help with the high cost of insulin. This guy's amazing. There's a man named Dr. Stanley Whittingham. He's a professor at Binghamton University. He also won the Nobel Prize uh, for the inventing the lithium-ion battery. He's the inventor. And this is one great guy. He gets lured by all these great universities, but he stayed at Binghamton University, which is one of the finest state universities in the country. I have a number of very, very outstanding graduates of that institution that work for me. One of them standing over there, and she reminds me of it all the time. Um, but in any case, uh, um, we got um, uh, a big federal investment, 60-some-odd million dollars, uh, to start uh, creating a lithium-ion battery research and, and manufacturing hub right in Binghamton, New York. A lot of these cities, and this is not just true in New York, Syracuse had carrier, no longer there. Uh, IBM was in Binghamton, no longer there. But these new industries will take their place and give these communities a sense of hope across the America. Uh, Pedro Gamboa Bermude, Bermudez from Brooklyn. Pedro was born in Guatemala, worked as a baggage handler at JFK International Airport for more than 13 years. He came to the United States at a young age, pursuing the American dream. But now he's helping others achieve that dream as well. He organized his terminal to form a union at JFK Airport and is pushing with the labor union, SEIU, for, good job, for the Good Jobs for Good Airports Act, a bill that I've co-sponsored and would set a living wage for airport workers. Uh, David Anderson from Albany, New York. This guy's a great guy. He's president and CEO of New York Creates, the Albany Nanotechs Complex. Albany Nanotech is the leading public-private partnership for developing the next generation of semiconductor uh, chips. It's probably the leading place in the world, and we are uh, hoping to get some the chips and science bill, uh, help fund places like this, and we're hoping to get good funding for it. He's the president of it, and they are doing cutting-edge research. You know that Dutch firm that makes some of the machines that make the chips that we said couldn't sell to China? Their only U.S. location is right there in Albany. 
Here's a wonderful lady, Cheryl Brannan from Yonkers. She's a leader in black maternal health and president of a group called Sister to Sister International. The horrible disparity, racial disparity in maternal morbidity is something America should be ashamed of. Well, Cheryl sort of educated me on this issue, and uh, um, we passed, as you know, in the omnibus, one year of funding uh, on Medicaid and CHIPS for maternal, uh, uh, maternal uh, health, and we're fighting this year to get the whole omnibus done. And finally, Imram Ansari from Long Island just started his family, but they've been rattled by huge amounts of student debt. But thanks to Joe Biden's extensions of the moratorium on payments, he has been able to buy a home and will benefit even more when Republicans stop their push. The president agreed to do this. Right-wing Republicans, MAGA Republicans, are trying to get it overturned in court. They go to their special little court where they know their dis judges are in their favor. This will go up to the Supreme Court. We're fighting that so we can get so Imram and many millions of others like him can get their lives on track. So these nine guests show two things. One, they show the amazing accomplishments that we had in the last Senate. And I would remind people of our seven major bills in the, in the, in the last year. Um, six, six were bipartisan. But it also shows the need for implementation. And implementation of these major accomplishments will be a top focus for us this year, working with the administration, working with our senators, and working with the various agencies, as well as whatever legislation is needed. So that's, uh, let me go on now to the, so too. Um, I'm looking forward for he from hear uh, hearing President Biden later today about the amazing progress we've made in improving the lives of American families and to hear his vision for the next two years in the administration. Um, all of the, uh, as majority leader, and under the leadership and vision laid out by President Biden, we've been able to deliver more for the American people than ever before. All the bills that we passed, like guns, like PACT, like bipartisan infrastructure, like chips and science, like marriage equality, we did bipartisan. So people say, how are you going to get things done this year? I always try to get things done in a bipartisan way. Getting things done is number one in the Senate. For most issues, you need bipartisanship. Now, of course, when we can't get things done in a bipartisan way, we'll try to get them done on our own. And that was the American Rescue Plan, passed in 2021, and, of course, the Inflation Reduction Act, passed in 2022. Um, and we have, you know, we've had one of the most historic Senates around. This Senate majority has stuck together. We've gotten votes. Unity is our strength. And we're going to keep at it. And I believe we will stay unified. I'm really, really excited about the, uh, up the upcoming two years, as I said. But there's an additional layer, which is implementation. And we're going to do everything we can to implement all these great accomplishments. People say, well, a lot of people don't know of them. Well, of course, they passed in legislation. Not everybody follows day to day what's going on in the Senate or what's going on in the House. But this year, you will see us rolling out these things that matter to people. I just saw it in my home state in New York. We passed the bipartisan infrastructure bill, a record amount of money for infrastructure. People sort of read about it. Maybe they read a line, but, you know, it's abstract. But last week, the President and I went to Gateway, which has been a dream and passion of mine, and announced it's really happening. And the exultation in New York was great. That's going to happen over and over and over in state after state and city after city. So I believe you're going to see uh, the American public really, really um, proud, popular, and happy with what we were able to do, in addition to what we'll try to do in uh, this Senate, okay? So we are unified here in the Senate as Democrats. House Democrats are pretty unified, too. But it's a stark, stark contrast to compare what's going on with House Republicans. The, you know, the back and forth between Speaker McCarthy and the MAGA Republicans, and it's, it shows lack of unity, which is very, very worrisome and troublesome. Um, right now, 
the House Republicans are risking economic disaster by holding our country hostage to just to push their extreme, unpopular, and downright dangerous agenda. And that's why they're scared to show their cards to the American people in general, and certainly when it comes to debt ceiling. Our plan's simple. It's a plain, simple plan. Raise the debt limit clean. It's simple, but it's a real plan. It's how we done, done it three, uh, four times in the last several years under both Republican and Democratic administrations. And we are saying to tell our Republican friends and Speaker McCarthy, show us your plan. He says he wants cuts. Where? He hasn't named a single place where he wants them. Is it going to be Social Security or Medicare? Don't just say no. Prove it. Show us your plan. Now you say, well, he said, well, he's not going to do that. But a number of his Republicans are still saying they want to do it. The very same Republicans who got their way when they were organized, we can't be sure they won't cut Social Security and Medicare until we see their plan. So um, the, the only thing we hear is a lot of rhetoric. One member says they want to cut the woke agenda. What's that? What cuts does that mean? Some say the woke military agenda. I don't even know what the heck they're talking about. But we need a plan. And yesterday, the House Appropriations Chair said they'd consider cutting SNAP benefits. Money to feed children who would otherwise go hungry? Are they really going to cut that? They have no plan. No plan. You can't say we want cuts. Show and, 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 and then not show us what they are. So it's getting to be clear, you know, well, let me just say, if making sure that hungry children are part of the woke agenda, then we certainly don't have the same agenda, okay? So Republicans are, in, are stuck. They can't govern. They can't agree on anything. I, instead, they're focused on political theater. They don't do any, they're not trying to do anything real. And we hope they won't continue to do this on something as important as the surveillance balloon. China, China sent that surveillance balloon over. The, the Biden administration was calm, calculated, and effective. According to, they listened to the military experts. They listened to the intelligence experts. And they did the right thing. But Republicans, even before they saw and knew what was happening, started, some of them, not all, lambasting the president. Those criticisms were at best premature and in all probability highly political. This is one area where we don't need politics. So we need Democrats and Republicans to come together. We need the country to come together to condemn China for what it did and have a unified front in dealing with the Chinese Communist Party. I applaud President Biden for his leadership. I applaud that he listened to the military and national security experts. And I think as we go forward in time, everyone's going to see what he did was the right thing. We hope our Republican colleagues will avoid the politics. And there's some talk of a joint resolution condemning China. I hope that's what they do. Ready for your questions. Yes. Well, well, I think the president will do a very good job at selling the accomplishment. From what I hear, there are like 40 million people to watch. It's not the Super Bowl, but it's a heck of a lot of people. And I think he will do a good job in letting people know. But part of it is a process. You pass legislation, the next day all the things, you know, we don't have 100 bridges built or 220 chip fab plants built. It happens. And over the next year or two, people are going to see these accomplishments. They are really strong. Anyone who's looked at them compares the Senate that we've led um, and gotten this legislation done and originated a lot of it, like the insulin bill, which we originated here. Um, uh, it says it's great. Now we're starting to hear from people. I'm hearing from people about insulin because that got implemented right uh, a month ago. We're starting to hear, or I said it, I heard from people about Gateway and the jobs, 
But it's going to take a little bit of time, but we have to focus on implementation. It's very important uh, to show the American people in concrete, real terms, in job terms, in dollar terms, what we've done. And let's look at some of the facts. Unemployment is low. Job creation is high. Wages go up. So things are getting done, but obviously we have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing to get that done. Yes? Okay. A, okay. Look, first, to slow the agenda and withhold appointments, especially in the military and in the State Department and everywhere else, hurts our national security. So I think that's the wrong thing to do, and a couple of Republicans seem to make a practice of that, um, but it's a bad idea. Now, with 51 votes, they'll have less ability to do that than, with, than they had with 50 last time, but they're still doing it. On the specific question, I've talked to Mark Warner on several occasions. I support his efforts for the Intelligence Committee to gain, gain some access to what, what these documents are. He's working on that. The administration knows I've supported his efforts, and I think they're going to be successful. Yes? Well, there'll be a limit to what he can discuss because a lot of it will be classified. But again, I think he can say this. I've said it. It's not classified. By letting the balloon be shot down over water, we got far greater look at these balloons, which are relatively new. Um, we didn't know about them. This, our military and our surveillance, NSA, didn't know about them till last year. Three of them went over when Trump was there, but you can't blame Trump because he didn't know of them. They didn't know of them then. We're just learning of them. Having them come down over water is a, is, is a huge, huge advantage than having them come down over land. Because over water, much of the surveillance balloons stuff can be recovered. So we're going to know what it is, and we're also going to know what they've, what they've sought. And even as the balloon uh, came over the southeastern part of the United States, we were monitoring it very, very carefully to see what the Chinese were picking up and not. So I think we're going to learn a lot. How much he can t I think he can talk about that he, did, he listened to the military. By the way, had he not listened to the military, do you think those same Republicans would have said, he was premature, you know, he did it too soon, he should have listened to the military. I bet some of them would have. But in any case, although we, we, that didn't happen. Um, so I think that uh, he, will, he will show why he did it, but I don't think we'll get the details till we have our classified briefing on Thursday. And by the way, that briefing was going to be the Gang of Eight, but lots of members wanted it. They were entitled to it. So I requested that it be expanded to the whole Senate, and the administration agreed. Yes? I don't know if he'll call for it in his speech, but I think it's something that we need. The permitting reform will actually make it a lot easier to implement much of the green energy that we have. I think the bill we proposed actually, according to most of the modelers, including that great modeler in Princeton, I forgot their name. The guy has two S's in his name, like Shelby Summers. I don't know what his name is. But um, – uh, shows that would actually decrease the uh, permitting would decrease the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere. So I'm for it. Yes. Okay. Good question. Uh, I on the debt ceiling, it should be done without brinksmanship, without hostage taking, without confrontation. It should be passed as we've done under both President Trump and President Biden. Bipartisan cooperation, get it done. But the idea of where there should be tax cuts, where there should be uh, tax, uh, it, where there should be spending cuts, where there should be tax increases, belongs in the budget. We're going to have to negotiate a budget this year, and that's where we should do it. I agree 
that too many very ultra-rich people, too many big corporations, even after the IRA, don't pay their fair share of taxes. And I'd like to see that on the table, but not as a demand that unless we get that done, we can't, uh, we're not going to pass the debt ceiling. Last one. Lady in red. Okay, we'll do you two. Okay. Uh, Senator, on the second question, Senator Murray and uh, Collins, they're good. Uh, they're very both excellent legislators. They both have cooperated on many issues in the past, and they're hopeful that we can get a budget resolution done in the Senate. The House, as I said, they're so divided over there in the Republican caucus, I don't think we can just wait around for them unless somehow magic strikes and there's real unity over there. In terms of the bipartisan legislation, there's a whole lot of up. I have a long list. But I have to discuss that with my Senate colleagues, with my Republican colleagues, with the House. And you'll be seeing in the next little while some bipartisan legislation that we think can move forward. Thank you, everybody.